Rose here. In my last video, I showed why Charles T. Russell started the Zion's Watchtower magazine, a magazine company which has become the organization in which close to 9 million people are reported as members and refer to themselves as Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, before I go on and show you exactly how the faithful slave, the faithful and discreet wise slave, came about, please make sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons to help this video go out to a larger audience. Algorithms and all. During my research, I found out all about C.T. Russell's marriage, and I think that's why it interested me so much. I had never heard anything about her. I didn't even know he was married at his death in 1916. In my last video podcast, we saw how Charles Russell, after selling the haberdashery or clothing stores he and his father owned, started a Bible study in which they would have a group of people over to discuss the different religions of the day. These groups would discuss their personal interpretations and theories of what was in the Bible. Well, Charles took many of these interpretations, doctored them up, and came up with his own interpretations. Then he started a magazine company to spout his personal interpretations as Bible truths. After he started the Bible student movement, well, the easiest way for me to explain what he did is to say he became very self-important. He became so arrogant to the point he believed everything he spouted and preached was actually coming directly from God. Charles Russell stated that he alone could explain what was in the Bible. Everyone else would go into spiritual darkness without his writings, and many people believed him. I was really interested when I started to find out the way he treated his wife, Mariah, after she came up with him, Charles, being the faithful steward, or faithful and discreet slave, as they are referred to today. Charles Russell married Moriah Frances Ackley on March 13, 1879, after just a few months' acquaintance. During the early days of their marriage, both Moriah and Charles Russell influenced each other's thinking. Moriah was significantly more educated than Charles. Charles had a common school education with some follow-up with private tutors. Mariah graduated high school in Pittsburgh and attended Curry Normal School, a teacher training college. They married with the intent of starting a magazine to preach their interpretations of the Bible, their personal interpretations of the Bible. Just like George Storrs magazine, the Bible Examiner, and Dr. Barber's, the Herald of Christ's Presence, magazines full of those men's personal interpretations of the Bible. So, four months after they were married, Russell and Moriah put out the very first issue of Zion's Watchtower and Herald of Christ's Presence in July 1879. This is very important to remember. The very first copy of Zion's Watchtower came out after Charles was married not before. After their magazine, Zion's Watchtower, started to gain traction, the Bible student movement really took hold. There were many people who took what was in this magazine as Bible truths. Russell would have them go out and sell his magazines and later books he wrote as Cole Porters. A Cole Porter at that time was someone who employed a religious group to distribute Bible-based literature. Russell referred to his co-porters as Bible students. Mariah really played a major role in helping Russell grow his Bible student movement. She served as one of the directors of the Watchtower Society, so she was responsible for overseeing the affairs of the corporation in order to protect the interests of the shareholders. 
Simply put, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, which is what the company later became known as, was nothing more than a money-making corporation that had shareholders who needed to be answered to. This particular publishing company sold magazines and books with Charles Russell's personal interpretations of the Bible for a profit. As one of the directors, Mariah was not only responsible for the affairs of this publishing company, she also acted as treasurer, taking care of the business finances. She was also secretary, taking corporate minutes and notes during any board meetings or shareholder meetings. Due to Mariah's education, she was a logical choice for editorial assistance with contributing to the articles in the Zion's Watchtower magazines and publications. See, within the Second Adventist movement, which is what Russell's ideas came out of, female evangelists and authors were accepted. So neither Russell or any of their readers who came out of the Second Adventist movement would object to any contributions Mariah made to any of the articles or publications, just because she was a woman. Well, by 1894, there were many followers who felt Russell was being dishonest in his business practices regarding the Watchtower Society's corporate funds. They felt he was making extremely bad business decisions without first talking to the rest of the board of directors. They were also getting tired of Russell's authoritarian leading Russell started to feel that everyone should obey and follow whatever he said, because after all, everything he said was as if coming from God. So Russell felt like he could say and do whatever he wanted to, just like the governing body of today. Now, because Moriah was treasurer of the business, she knew exactly what went on in the company's financial books. And there were some who wanted Moriah to testify against Russell in court, but she refused to do that. Instead, Moriah came up with the teaching that Russell was the faithful and wise servant of Matthew 24, much like the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses today, claiming they are the faithful and discreet slave. In 1895, Russell tricked Moriah into traveling around defending him as the faithful and wise slave, she traveled to many of the ecclesia, or congregations, explaining how her husband fit the Bible's definition of the faithful slave at Matthew 24. And as that slave, everyone had to listen and obey him, respecting any decisions he made. And that's exactly what she did. She would go to these congregations and explain that Russell was God's servant that acted as Jehovah's mouthpiece. That, my friends, is how the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society came up with the teaching of the faithful and discreet slave. That's how the teaching got its start. The understanding of that teaching and who that slave is has just changed multiple times over the last 145 years. Personally, I think Russell promised Moriah that if she talked him up as the faithful slave, he would give in to her requests for a greater voice in what was being put in the publications. Because they were married and the Bible considered them to be one flesh, Moriah should be part of that faithful steward too. And as such, she should be able to explain Bible knowledge and understanding as well. Moriah just wanted to be equal with Charles when it came to the development of the theology that they were being printed in the magazines and books that were coming out of the publishing company that Moriah helped start. She wanted to have a say when it came to any teachings or new light. Instead, while Moriah was away talking Russell up as the faithful and discreet slave, Russell used that time to position himself against her and solidify his opposition to her equality. So when she came back, they started fighting about what went into print. Then Russell started to belittle her in public and in private meetings in front of others. And then, after getting his way, he would make Mariah kiss him 
to demonstrate that she accepted his terms. And instead of giving her equal say, he started talking about divorce proceedings. He claimed the marriage was a mistake. Now, it's important to remember that in the late 1800s and early 1900s, wives did not have very many legal rights. Wives were basically at the mercy of their husbands, and Russell used that to his advantage, especially as a wealthy man. When they first got married in 1879, Russell appreciated Mariah's logical thinking and input. But by 1895, as the Bible students became a bigger following of Russell's, that changed. According to later court testimony and documents, Russell became even more authoritarian towards Mariah. He would ignore her for months, only communicating through letters. He told Mariah that she had no rights that he was bound to respect. He started to find fault with anything she said and told her that there were thousands of women who would feel privileged to be Russell's wife. If he demanded sweet potatoes, she should supply him sweet potatoes. If he wanted pumpkin pie, well, she should humbly supply pumpkin pie. He even tried to spread the word that Mariah had a mental aberration. Mariah had to go to court for protection against that because back then, if you were found to be mentally off, you were placed in poorly run madhouses, jails, and almshouses, and you were harshly treated. The 1975 yearbook on page 69 shows another problem that was going on during this time. It mentions a Rose Ball who came to live with the Russells at their apartment and worked in the Bethel home in 1888, nine years after, after the Russells were married. According to court documents of Mariah's later testimony under oath, Russell had repeatedly molested Rose in 1894 calling her his little wife. Mariah told the judge that when she questioned Rose about this, Rose told Mariah that she had not welcomed Russell's advances. Rose responded to him, I am not your wife, to which Russell replied, I will call you daughter, and a daughter has nearly all the privileges of a wife. According to the same court proceedings, around 1895-1896, Mariah came down with erysopelas. That's a type of bacteria infection that affects the upper layers of the skin. It's a painful and shiny light red swelling of a large area of the skin. In more severe cases, blisters may even form as well. Well, Charles completely ignored Mariah and said that she caught this illness because she was insisting on her own ideas that the Lord was inflicting this illness upon her as judgment because she was going against his chosen steward, Russell himself. In 1897, 18 years after they were married and started publishing Zion's Watchtower, Mariah moved out of the apartment. Shortly after she moved out, she came back to their apartment to get some of her belongings. Russell told her that Everything that she made as his wife was his. And Russell did his best to make sure Mariah didn't get anything. In December of 1897, Russell mortgaged the Bible house at 5060 Arch Street for $15,000, which is nearly $530,000 in today's value. The first week of February 1898, Russell transferred to the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society around $48,000 roughly, around $1.6 million in today's value. Then on March 1st, 1898, in order for Mariah not to get the Bible House in Pennsylvania, Russell deeded the Bible House real estate to the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. Then, around April 1st, 1898, Russell donated the rest of his personal assets of Tower Publishing Company 
to the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. Now, Regarding all of Russell's multiple efforts to donate all of his assets to the Watchtower Bible Tract Society, the Court of Common Pleas in Pittsburgh stated, The purpose of all of his transactions was to deprive the wife of her dower interest and was a fraud on her, and the subsequent donations to the Watchtower Society are plainly made with the same reckless disregard of the rights of the wife, and with the intent to defeat her of any interest or claim she might have had for her support. It has been adjudicated against him, Russell, that his property was disposed of by him in fraud of his wife's rights. After all was said and done, the appraised value of Russell's donation of all assets of the Tower Publishing Company, including the building and land that had been purchased, was worth $186,000, nearly $6.5 million today. In April of 1903, Mariah filed for a divorce separation. She wanted to formalize the couple's informal marital separation status and obtain some financial support from her estranged husband. Mariah wanted was then legally termed divorce from bed and board with alimony. Today, it would be called a legal separation. Mariah did not want, nor did she seek an absolute divorce, which would have terminated the marriage. Well, in June 1903, Mariah was awarded a judgment of legal separation on the basis of mental cruelty and Russell was ordered to pay Mariah $40 per month in alimony, which was to be retroactive as of April 1903, but Russell refused to pay. In April 1906, a jury once again granted Mariah Russell her full request and alimony. Again, Russell appealed it. In March 1908, alimony was increased to $100 per month, and Russell was court-ordered to pay Mariah Russell's attorney fees and court costs, but again, Russell refused. Between 1903 and 1909, Russell appealed the court's decisions five times, and he lost at each appeal. In fact, this is what Judge Orlady of the Superior Court of Pennsylvania had to say regarding the separation and alimony which was awarded to Mariah. He said that he had a hard time understanding Russell's view of his duty as husband to Mariah. He said that Russell felt that his rights, Russell's rights as a husband, were radically different from the standard imposed on him by the law and that was recognized by all of the courts in the country. Judge Orlady said that Russell's conduct towards his wife evidenced such insistent egotism and extravagant self-praise that it would be manifest to the jury that his conduct towards Mariah was one of continual arrogant domination that would necessarily render the life of any sensitive Christian woman a burden and make her life and condition intolerable. Now by this point, Russell's Bible student movement had expanded to a number of congregations or ecclesia. Zion's Watchtower and Herald of Christ's Presence was being widely distributed every year, despite having no knowledge of Greek or Hebrew, no formal theological training in the Bible, 2,000 congregations in the United States, Canada, Britain, and Europe chose Russell to serve as their spiritual leader. Charles and Mariah's court testimonies were printed verbatim in the 1906 Brooklyn Daily Eagle on April 26, 1906. All testimony regarding Russell's relationship with Rose Ball how Russell had donated everything 
to the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society to get out of Mor- Moriah getting anything, as well as Russell's attempts to get out of any monthly alimony that he was, that Moriah was awarded. I want you to think about this. Imagine any member of the governing body today being publicly exposed in the media like Russell had been. Even though Russell preached morality and love, the media in the newspapers was showing him to be an unloving, immoral husband. So how did Russell get away with this with all of his followers? By discrediting Maria. He denied her testimony of events that were printed verbatim in the newspaper with his own conflicting version of events in the July 15, 1906 Zion's Watchtower. Russell used the entire Watchtower to discredit Moriah and print his own made-up versions of accounts. Now, I've actually read the whole magazine. It's beyond interesting to see what Russell had to say about Moriah. His attorney at the time, Joseph Franklin Rutherford, endorsed Russell's self-exoneration, even publishing a 64-page booklet that was entirely devoted to putting out all of the fires among his followers regarding Charles Russell's character. Now, though there were some followers that didn't fall for Russell's attempt at self-exoneration, in this July 15, 1906 Zion's Watchtower, there were many that did. In late April or early May of 1909, an arrest warrant was issued for C.T. Russell by the Pittsburgh court. Now, Russell knew of this arrest warrant and left the United States for a five-week tour of Europe to preach his teachings. Now, while Russell was out of the country, Judge Rutherford, his attorney, had to put out the storm. So Judge Rutherford and some other prominent men paid the $60 court costs. All unpaid alimony was caught up, and Russell was also required to post a $5,000 bond for future alimony payments to be made to Mariah, which was also provided by these men. Subsequently, all criminal proceedings against Pastor Charles Taze Russell were dropped. So Charles and Mariah were married in March 13, 1879. Four months later, the first issue of Zion's Watchtower and Herald of Christ's Presence went out in July of 1879. The first series of Millennial Dawn, which was later titled Studies in the Scriptures, was done in the mid-1880s. In 1886, the first book in the series, titled Divine Plan of the Ages, was published. By 1910, Russell had six volume sets of studies in the scriptures. Just in studies in the scriptures alone, nearly 20 million copies were printed and distributed around the world in several languages by his death in 1916. Mariah had been credited with helping write some of those volumes and magazines. Because we cannot forget the Zion's Watchtower magazine that was also being published and sold. It is now called The Watchtower. Pastor Russell made millions of dollars during the time that he and Mariah were married. Yet Russell, the faithful servant at that time, contested what little alimony the courts did award Moriah until his death in 1916. Now, this told me a little bit about something about Moriah. At the time of Charles Russell's funeral at Carnegie Hall in Pittsburgh in 1916, wearing a veil, she walked down the aisle to the casket and laid a bunch of lilies of the valley on his casket, which were Charles' favorites. Attached to them was a ribbon bearing the words, To my beloved husband. Charles Taze Russell never paid Mariah Francis alimony. The Watchtower Bible and Tract Society paid her monthly alimony and expenses until her death. Mariah Francis Ackley Russell 
died at the age of 88 in St. Petersburg, Florida, on March 12, 1938. Russell never came up with anything on his own. A lot of what he was spouting and as his own personal interpretations and new knowledge of Bible understanding came from the Bible discussions he and his father had set up in 1870. Charles was a master at taking other people's ideas and interpretations, doctoring them up, and making it look like he was the one that came up with all of them. Charles Russell was an absent, unloving husband. He had multiple failed predictions under his belt since 1878. He sold and backed a harmful cancer cure. He lied and profited off his followers with his miracle wheat. He lied in court about being able to read Greek. Russell didn't even know the letters of the Greek alphabet. Charles Russell was a liar, a cheater, a con man, and a fraud. Russell never lived to see the long-awaited return of Jesus Christ bringing in Armageddon, as he kept proclaiming and predicting. On his return from touring the western and the southwestern United States, Russell died from complications related to diverculitis on October 31, 1916. He was in a train car that was traveling through Pampa, Texas. Russell's last request was to die in a Roman toga, which was created using Pullman sheets. This is why the organization wants Russell forgotten as the first faithful and discreet slave. But his successor, Joseph Franklin Rutherford, Judge Rutherford, Russell's attorney at the time, wasn't any better. He too was a liar and a con man, just as much as Russell. But you're going to have to come back next time to see just what Joseph Rutherford did immediately after Charles' death to not only take over the business, but to become the faithful and discreet slave of his day as Charles Russell had been. Well, hopefully you enjoyed this video podcast. Until next time, please take care of yourselves and stay strong. Don't let those men in New York win. Now, if we think about it, we're not born as friends of God because we're born as sinful offspring of Adam. Actually, if you think about it, we're born as enemies of God. Sometimes you'll hear people say of a little baby, look at that little angel. But more accurate would be to say, look at that little enemy.